Well, hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> hello, anybody who's um, tuning into this video. My name is Christian McNeil. Um, my practice is called Elements of Wellbeing, and today I'm speaking with David McMullen who is a fellow facilitator here in Glasgow. Um, I've known David for about, I think it's about four years, David, would that be right? I think it's um, maybe longer. Yeah. Um, and um, I've really enjoyed getting to know David over that time. And, um, and I'm delighted that he has agreed to join me in conversation today. And this is part of my initiative throughout 2017 to um, do what I can to encourage the grassroots spread of the the, the three principles and, and um, doing a series of um, webinars and conversations with people who have come into it from other areas and, and, and perhaps slightly less conventional ways and, and just to not so much to provide any kind of how-to but just to inspire people um, anyone who's thinking of getting into this field to, to maybe think more broadly, more widely, to see different possibilities. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing where our conversation goes today, David. Um, and it'd be nice to hear from you how you came across this work in the first place, this understanding, or if we could even settle on what we call it, how we describe the three principles paradigm. <laughs> but feel free to use whatever expressions sit with you. David, over to you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me to, to come on, Christian. This is um, uh, it's the first time I've done this. So uh, if, I'm, if, I, if I stumble, <laughs> then I apologise. Um, but as far as how I came across this, it was... I think it was 2013, June 2013, and Michael Neal came to do a day-long talk in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And I attended that, and you kind of listened for the whole day and, and dipped in and out of, yeah, I think I know what he's talking about, to I have absolutely no idea what he's talking about. And going to a place where I was really angry about what he was saying. Um, at the time, I was I, I worked in the licence trade for many years, and so I, I used to run bars and nightclubs. And at the time where I was, it was a particularly fractious time. And I remember, Mike, or at least this is what I heard, that he said, you know, your stress and anxiety, anger, whatever, isn't coming from anyone else, it's coming from within yourself. And I found that really insulting, actually. Um, because I thought, well, this guy doesn't do my job. He doesn't, he doesn't live in the same world as me, so it's okay for him to sit up there and, and say these things. Um, but something about that day just really connected with me, and I, I can't really, I, I can't say how. Or why, but I left and I got his book and I read his book and I did not understand. I really struggled through that book, um, The Inside Out Revolution. Mm -hmm. Really struggled um, trying to understand what it was all about. I tried to tell other people what it was about really badly. Um, and I can't remember what else. I went on to read Jack Pransky's book next, Somebody Should Have Told Us. And something about reading that book helped create a shift in me. And from there, I just started reading much more, looking online. Um, and then eventually, um, I think it was later that year or maybe at the start of the next year, I came across yourself, mm -hmm. um, with the Three Principles Scotland meetup group, and, and joined that. And the rest is kind of history. <laughs> so that was that. That was my introduction to to the three principles. I had been, uh, I guess you might say, a spiritual seeker for for many many years, and I'd actually, you know, listening to people. Like one person who I listened to regularly was audios of Wayne Dyer, and and he actually had quite a big impact on me just listening. I never really quite grasped what he was talking about, but it just I really felt that it had made a difference. But this 
coming across the three principles somehow has just been really different to all of that. Um, I really feel looking over the last three and a half, almost four years, the change has been quite profound. You know, I think I would have described myself as as quite high maintenance <laughs> or highly strong and um I reacted really quickly to things and I always felt really justified in my reactions, especially in my work, because it was often, you know, it was fast paced, it was uh, you know, it was a lot of kind of balls in the air at one time. Many, many things could have gone wrong. Many things did go wrong. And I always felt that the way to deal with that was to be as forceful as possible. Um, and that's kind of how I managed myself and managed the, the work that I was doing at the time. And so, which is a kind of 180 degrees from where I am just now. So I still, of course, react to things um, and I still get angry at things and, you know, still all the things that human beings do. But it's just entirely different in the way that I kind of live day to day and the way that I respond to things that are going on round about me. So. So could I ask you a couple of things about that? Um, so, and they're, they're maybe not unrelated. So if you were to revert to Michael Neal's original assertion that stress wasn't coming from your job, how would you see it now? And could you give examples of what you mean by, you know, I react very differently today? Right. Um, so taking the, the first question about stress not coming from my job. Mm -hmm. So I left the licensed trade very, early, very shortly after. Um, I attended that talk mm -hmm. so I don't have any examples of doing that kind of work with this understanding I think I would be a completely different manager mm -hmm. if I was I would like actually I'm, I'm quite intrigued about how I would be doing that type of work with now that I've you know been introduced to the three principles mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what I'm doing now I work for the civil service mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's a big, you know, I work in a big um, department, lots and lots of people, lots of hierarchy, lots of um, politics, office politics that go on. And I see people reacting to that every single day. Um, I, I hear people saying, I'm so stressed, this job's so stressful, um, I can't wait to get out of here, I hate this place. And, I th and I'm just fascinated by that because we're all doing the exact same job. And yet everyone's experience of that is entirely different. And so do I now see that stress comes from me and not my job? And I, and I would have to say that I absolutely see that. Hmm. But there are times where I don't see that. And there have been a couple of occasions where I've had to challenge a decision that was made. And, you know, I remember on, on one occasion I reacted, I would probably say I reacted quite badly to a decision uh, at work and it had to do with my um, performance rating. But I felt that the performance rating that I was given absolutely didn't reflect my performance. And when I was told it, I was, I was fuming. Like I was, actually I was, I was livid and I felt... I felt myself slip back into the way that I would have normally reacted a few years ago. And, um, and I so quickly caught myself mm. and realized this will not do you any favors <laughs> if, you, if you proceed down this path. Um, but I was completely, once I got over the, the initial, I guess, disappointment and shock, I then dealt with it really kind of forthright and but there was a kind of impersonal touch to it. I wasn't so wrapped up in the outcome. Mm -hmm. I absolutely wanted to pursue my perspective on things um, and that meant taking out you know a grievance mm -hmm. and going to a hearing and, and, and then you know having that addressed. 
and I dealt with it really different and I sat with it before I made any decision for a few weeks mm-hmm. and I went through the motions of actually I don't care if this performance rating is, is rubbish I don't actually care enough to do anything about it but then something changed and it was like actually it would be wrong not to mm-hmm. pursue it um, and so I did and I felt like I did it I was really quite impressed with myself I felt like it addressed it in a really grown up way. Um, And I just remember thinking how different that had been, that that was for me. And um, how different it would have been (laughs) had I not come across this understanding. (laughs) I'd probably get fired. (laughs) Um, And I most definitely wouldn't have been as understanding of where that decision had come from. Uh-huh. Uh, I know for a fact that I would have been much more aggressive in my approach to dealing with it. Um, so that was, that was for me a real, it's kind of one of those times where you say, okay, well, how does this understanding work in the real world? You know, it's okay, you can sit at home, you go, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm feeling wonderful on the inside and and you know life is amazing and everything's amazing and then you go out into your life and something happens and then for me that was a real test Mm -hmm. okay so does it work i mean that i don't mean it like that but that's the only words i can think of to use but does this actually have an impact when it comes to the nitty-gritty of life um and for me that was absolutely an example of the change that had happened within me and also be able to just take the the kind of emotional personal me out of the equation and just deal with the facts of what we're going on yeah lovely lovely uh, and you touched on a couple of things there that I'd, I'd, I'd like to um go into but I, it, did, it did just occur to me that we have got a sort of elephant in the living room situation with the bird on your <laughs> <laughs> that we haven't mentioned, so would you care to introduce her? <laughs> this is Annabelle. <laughs> and she's your pet. What kind of bird is she? She's a cockatiel. <laughs> so, so, we had a discussion before we pressed record, but the viewer might be thinking it's some kind of Monty Python esque thing. <laughs> um, she is, as I frequently say, she's the smallest but the loudest, most destructive. And messiest person in the house. <laughs> and she's the only female. So I don't know if there's a connection there. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, she's good. She's, uh, she's been laying eggs over the last month. But thank- thankfully, she stopped. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, yeah, but just to pick up on, on, on what you were talking there about the, you know, the kind of impact and implications of these um principles that you know that 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 is the benefit you know and i think for me as you know that that, that there is a sort of that there are fundamental principles the 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 three principles paradigm is a fundamental explanation of how human beings work psychologically and it applies to everybody but the real value is that it is through understanding that how it makes changes in life And, and you know and i thought you illustrated that really nicely and you reminded me of something that happened just yesterday and I'd gone into the kitchen and I was about to make coffee and, and um, you know I got the coffee pot down and headed and then I went to just do something else beforehand and I had this terrible crash and I jumped out my skin and I felt you, you know sort of I, I mean I was in the real sort of fight or flight state and, and what and all that had happened was that the coffee pot lid had fallen you rolled onto the <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that's what you know. I I wanted to blame someone. I was in the house in my own. <laughs> I say I wanted to blame someone or something for just for a second. Yeah. Just for a second. Um. Even after I knew what had happened, because it, that sort of startle thing came up. Um. And I, and I, it, and it occurred to me that that's what I've been doing for much of my life before I kind of understood that you know the role that thought is playing in creating my 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 experience um and i've stuck with it i found something to blame for painful emotions uh, you know until now and sort of stuck with that and it's been such a freedom to see that that's just there may be a momentary um 
decision or choice or response to, 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 to blame, but actually very quickly when we know where experience is really being created, which is from within, from the flow of thought that's always going through us. It, you know, the freedom that comes from being, you know, from being able to let go of that. Yeah. And I thought, you, and then from there, coming to being able to come to that place of neutrality, which sometimes happens quickly, sometimes takes longer. Um, but, you know, you described coming to a place of neutrality in the face of what you perceived as um, unfair or inappropriate treatment at work. Yeah. And that touches on another thing I think that people often people who are new to this work or sometimes clients will will ask and and, and they when well, they're first introduced to this idea of experience being created from within rather than from exter external circumstances they hear things that haven't been said i.e i should like it if someone does something wrong or i should forever put up with it and, and those things are not being said mm. the difference from as was the case with me, you know, kind of reacting from a place of, um, you know, anger or hostility or up upset or insecurity of one form or another, or being able to sort of see the circumstance, whatever it might be, in a more neutral way and from a much quieter mind, a more kind of considered mind, think, well, is there something to be done here? Mm. And the irony or, or the, um, another implication or outcome, if you like, for me is that sometimes it's sort of choose your battles wisely thing. Sometimes it's just like, let it go, for God's sake, let it go. But yeah. other times it's, it's absolutely don't let this go. Yeah. This is one to take action on. And there's clarity and there's kind of courage and there's um consistency with that you know so it's, i think you put it a very grown-up way of dealing with it I don't know whether it's very grown up in my case but you know it is a much it is a more um sensible way of, of dealing with things and and when it's done minus the emotion it's easier for other people to hear and and to to, to respond to it's more likely to to, to result in a some a mutually beneficial outcome i have found yeah yeah and for, for me it was growing up mm -hmm. um and because I, I, it was such a, a change from how i would have responded you know only well, who knows in a different day i might have responded entirely different mm -hmm. um, i think i allowed myself the, the fact that i allowed myself to take time before actually taking action mm -hmm. That was a big, big change for me. I would have been in there, you know, steamroller in a head, <laughs> want to take down everyone round about, <laughs> right? Um, but the fact that I sat with that and then considered it and just allowed different thoughts about it to kind of come and go. And then I had a real strong sense that, no, actually the right thing is to challenge it. Um, and it turns out that that was absolutely the right thing to do because we discovered things that we didn't actually know. Um, so it was, in the end, I was actually kind of thanked for doing what I did. Hmm. Because it brought to light um, parts of that process that hadn't been known because I did quite a bit of research. Um, so it was, it was actually had a really positive outcome, not just because the, the, the rate, you know, the performance rating was changed, but actually it made us aware of things that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. So I had more than just one good outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and it didn't matter to me whether it got changed or not. Like I realized before I made any decision to, to kind of pursue it, it was like, actually, it doesn't matter. If the outcome of this doesn't go the way I would like it to go, then that's perfectly fine. Well, you're and touching I, on something really important there, I think, because it, that, that, that to me is, is um, you know, really corroborating the fact that you had come to a place of neutrality. Mm. You were no longer taking action in order to make yourself feel better you were taking action from a place of wisdom because it seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah. And the test of course is that you were, you were able, you were then comfortable with whatever outcome. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if you'd been taking action in order to feel better, there would only be one acceptable outcome for you or yeah. you know, 
indeed for any of us in that situation and and that's it sounds like very little but it's incredibly empowering and um you know it keeps one very centered you're not trying to change the whole world in order to be okay within mm. yeah and as part of the the process my my um appeal if you want to, i mean it was called a grievance i don't like calling that a grievance but i call it an appeal against that decision it was probably the most powerful thing I've ever written because it put the point across really clearly with no emotion in it. Mm. It was like, here are the facts. Here's why I disagree. Here's why I feel it needs to be kind of looked at. Um, and the person who that went to said, you know, this is the best appeal I've ever read. <laughs> it's like, wow. Such a difference from if I had sat down to write that from a place of I'm livid <laughs> and I want this to get changed. <laughs> but here's what's interesting: um, there are there are there are there are parts of my life where I don't see it. And if you had to ask me when I don't see it, how I was, I would say, "Oh, things are terrible because of blah blah blah." And in those occasions, that's where I, I, I totally miss it. Mm. And mostly that comes around with, you know, tidiness in the house. Mm. So I'll get myself really worked up about how untidy the house is. It's that bird. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and it's like, wow, that's fascinating. That doesn't look like it's coming from me. Mm -hmm. on those occasions it absolutely doesn't look like it's coming from me and yet I get tripped up by it you know at least once a week or more <laughs> and are there also times David where the house can be untidy and you're really chilled about it yeah because it is today yeah <laughs> because we're, <laughs> we're pulling things out mm -hmm. so this area that I'm sitting in just now was I mean it's it might look quite messy behind me but it, you know it was loads of stuff here earlier and the kitchens get stuff pulled out the cupboards and the bedrooms get stuff pulled out and I'm absolutely fine with that mm. but there could be you know two hours from now where I might start to feel really overwhelmed by that and that does not look like thought to me that looks like it's the house mm -hmm. and I find that absolutely fascinating yeah some people describe it as you know sometimes we see it sometimes we don't i i quite like this idea of you know we go up and down in our level of awareness mm. of our, the the creator of our experience um you know sometimes we're, we're entirely aware of it sometimes again speaking for myself i can feel like a total victim of somebody else's um bad behavior yeah yeah absolutely so it's it's fascinating to me and i find it um I think that's what keeps me hooked because I know that in those occasions I've still got more to see. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what, even when I'm feeling gripped by whatever emotion that I'm gripped by, I know that in that occasion there's still something to see. And so for me, that's, that, that keeps me really interested. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know about you, but I also find it, actually very encouraging that we never get out of this mm. that every teacher I know Sid Banks who discovered the three principles himself you know speaks to and exhibits that fact that you know sometimes they get caught up thinking that they, their experience is coming from external circumstances yeah no matter how deeply they at other times they know that not to be the case and mm. I, what i love about that is there's nowhere to there's nowhere to get to that you know it's all um who you and i are today and that the, the the depth of our understanding today is is sufficient we're not broken you know almost certainly we will see it more deeply if we continue to look in this direction over the rest of our lives but it's all where we are today is quite good enough and completely human completely normal yeah and yet there are times where i feel like i have been driven to see more 
mm. because I don't feel like I know enough. Mm. And then I kind of recognize that and pull right back. Right. So just kind of disconnect from, you know, all of the, the, the stuff that's kind of going on online and all of the new books and, and what have you. And so, um, and then I thought, oh, I'm really disconnected. <laughs> so then I, I'm like, oh, I must start to really read again. And, and it's like, ah, you're back in that thing again where the more that I try to see, the less I do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, completely. And I was talking to somebody the other day, and it's a strange thing because we talk about the three principles using language, you know, using conversation. But of course, it isn't an intellectual understanding. And just as you couldn't learn to ride a bike, probably for mo most people, <laughs> couldn't learn to ride a bike by being just given oral instructions without, you know, or having a conversation about it. There's got to be this doing, this embodiment of it, or to swim, or you know, anything like that. Um, and the, the different for me is in the principles that that embodied part seems to involve a kind of letting go, you know, not trying to force it or learn it in the way that you would learn times tables or the periodic table or something like that. You know, that is not helpful, but there's getting it inside seems to involve, you know, there's a paradox there of, um, you know, just forgetting about it for a bit, not, you know, taking your attention off, or maybe it's a bit like these magic eyes. You've got to kind of let your eye, your, your, your magic eye pictures where something emerges when your sight is softer rather than really intense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because the, the, the moments where I've had, I would say the, the kind of biggest insight, so the moments where I've not been doing anything learning related, mm -hmm. it's, you know, been in the shower and there was an occasion um a few months back where I had an overdraft mm -hmm. and I had the money to pay off this overdraft but and I was getting charged every month to have the overdraft and um I went to buy a new set of these iPhone um headphones mm -hmm. And they cost £29. And I remember being in the, the Apple shop and being outraged. It's £29 for a set of headphones. I thought that was daylight robbery. Mm -hmm. And then I realised, that's how much you're paying every month for this overdraft. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that just seemed, I don't know, something about that was affected me in a way that I can't really describe. And the next morning, I made the decision and I was in the shower and it just became so obvious that the only thing to do was to pay that off. And yet I had been paying that £29 for, I can't even tell you how many months. Mm -hmm. Months and months and months and months and months. <laughs> and then it became so clear, mm -hmm. get rid of that. Mm -hmm. Now that didn't come from sitting down and reading a book. Yeah. Or, you know, going to a training or something. That was just, I just became so obvious. And I had wrestled with that for the long, like for months. Mm -hmm. Should I, should I not? No, I won't because, you know, I want to keep the money that I've saved. And because one day, yada, yada, you know, I was making scenarios up in my head, you know, what happens if and I need that money and I continue to pay this £29 every month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet that one split second of I don't know it was it became so so clear and thinking yeah and so I went to work that day I came home I phoned the bank and the bank said oh no you can't um you would need to go into the branch to do that <laughs> so there came the first stumbling block mm -hmm. I left the house and went straight into town to go to the branch and she says, oh, no, you can't. You would need to be booked in to see an advisor. So there was stumbling block number two. And I said, okay, well, then book me in to see an advisor. Mm -hmm. And then it got, uh, it got shut down. And then they were like, do you want to keep the overdraft? And I was like, no, I want it, I want it gone. Mm -hmm. I want it gone. Um, because I'd had an, another insight about having an overdraft, which was it never goes to zero. So if you, you if once your bank account goes below zero and you've got a, a 
an overdraft that goes into minus. Mm. That minus could go to minus 100 million, but it will never go to minus zero <laughs> because it's past zero. And f- in my head, that meant I had more money than I had. Mm. And it was only when I had the realisation that somehow I connected the minus whatever it was with having more money. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really explain that. And then I realised if I saw my bank account going down and down and down until it got to zero and then it couldn't go any further than zero, then the choices that I made about the money that I had would be quite different. Mm. But because that never happened, then in my head I had more, so I would just go out and or buy something new. So it was quite, that for me was a big, big, that felt huge for me. Mm -hmm. Because it's not only the fact of what you see differently and the changes that you make, but it's the, it's the, it's experiencing that capacity to have kind of new, new thought, a different learning out of nowhere Mm. that changes your relationship with, with money and, 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 the same thing can happen in any area of, of life. Yeah. And does, as you know, when people, once people have had an insight, um, like it's Keith Blevins talks about there being an inevitable evolution, you know, that it'll happen, there'll, there'll, be, another, there'll be another area. You know, an insight once seen, it's, it's like fruit that's been tasted, it can't be untasted. Mm. But, so that, you, that area becomes sorted as it will. And then, the, the, you know, the psyche will find another, area or you know something else will come up yeah and, and it and it, it, so it tends to there is that internal kind of ripple effect where you, you know more and more areas of your life just become easier and simpler and more imbued with common sense or wisdom mm. yeah and i actually i i think for for lots of years no i don't think i know for lots of years i overspent mm. Because I realised, I realised now I overspent because I was, I felt really quite miserable. Mm. And no matter what I bought myself, it was never enough. And in, it was 2006, I, I kind of resigned myself to, you're just going to be someone who's miserable for the rest of your life. And I kind of just accepted that that was going to be the case. Because I was never satisfied. Mm. Nothing was ever enough for me. Um, and I had, that, I had that realization that nothing was ever enough. And so the next thought was, oh, well, you're just going to be unhappy forever. Oh, well, then I just need to be, <laughs> I just need to be unhappy forever. <laughs> because I'm just going to be one of those people. Because there are people like that. <laughs> and, I, and I had kind of accepted that well, I was just going to have to be one of them because nothing, no matter what it is. It's not good enough for me. Mm-hmm. And so the result of that was that I spent more money than I made trying to make myself feel good. And I did. Mm-hmm. It felt great. <laughs> it felt amazing. <laughs> Until the, the, you then have to pay it back. Yeah. Um, and I thought that my, my relationship with money had, I mean, and it has really quite drastically altered mm-hmm. uh, over the last few years. But it was just fascinating me to me to see that even though my relationship with money has completely changed, that insight changed it again. Yeah. And so what I realise is there is still more room for it to change. Yeah. Not just with money, but with every part of my life. Yeah. So and that that I know I keep saying this word, but that absolutely fascinates me. I find that just incredible. Yes, that whole experience of having insights is very. Um, it feels great that you know that 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 aha moment, whether it's about something small or something enormous, it feels it's very engaging. It's very um, uh, 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 sort of interesting, and it's 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 very positive. Um, it's very hopeful. Yeah. Again, well, it's speaking for myself at any rate. David, I, I, I'm just conscious of time and I would like to move on to okay. um, 
I know that you have also had some experience in sharing this, this with other people. And I'd just like to give you an opportunity to say a little bit about what you've done and where you're at now with that. So. Okay. So six months after the Michael Neal talk, I had the I had a feeling that I absolutely needed to go out and talk to people. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that I'd never done before in my life. I was terrified at the thought of it. But something was driving me to do that that was beyond anything I've ever experienced before. And so I decided to, uh, to do a one-night talk in Coatbridge, which is the, the town where I grew up. And, um, and it was, it was, so I'd set the day, decided I was doing it, um, started to invite people and had no idea what I was going to call it. And I was chatting to my, I was kind of starting to feel a bit panicky about, I don't know what to call this, this thing. I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. I just know I have to go out there and do this. And um, my, my partner said to me, oh, you know, I've got a folder that I keep on my desktop and I call it Tidy Mind. And it was like a bomb <laughs> just landed. Of course, that's the right thing to call it. That made so much sense. Because uh, for so many years, I'd said, you know, my my uh, my home is a reflection of my of my mind. My home is pristine and perfect. <laughs> <laughs> However, I now see that my mind was exactly the opposite, <laughs> uh, and I called it tidy mind, and it was it was a one off thing. Um, and uh, my mum was there, and she had phoned me up the day before or the day actually to say are you sure you want to do this? Like, who's going to come to this? Um, well, I mean, what's this all about? And I said, listen, mum, I don't care if no one turns up apart from me, I will be there. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. Uh, so she came along and she sat in the front and she just smiled the entire time. And um, she came up to me at the end and said, if I didn't like that, I would tell you. And uh, she said, and I absolutely loved it. And it was... It was one year after the anniversary of my brother's sudden death. Mm. And my mum at that, because it was the anniversary and things, she was, you know, she was really wasn't in a good place. And she phoned me the next day and said, today is the first day that I've been able to get up. I felt great, you know, got on with the housework and just felt really good. I really, really enjoyed that last night. That was brilliant. And so then I arranged one for January um, and then did the one in January and then started doing it weekly after that um, and called it Tidy Mind. And it was really my way of sharing the change that had happened in myself the best way that I could. And that lasted for a year and a half. And then at the end of it, as it was kind of getting to the end of it, I realised I'm losing direction with this. I don't know where this is going. I kind of felt as if I had run out of steam and I realised I needed time to just reflect and ground myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I had this idea, no, 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 you need to keep going, you need to keep going. But something else was saying, no, actually, just stop, take a break. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's what I did. And then... Um, so since that time, I've not actually kind of shared in any formal way uh, beyond kind of conversations with people who, you know, who might be having a, some challenge with something. But my intention is to continue the kind of tidy mind type theme because that makes a lot of sense to me. That's that makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else. Um, and I'm, I'm going to call this thing that I'm going to try. I have no idea how it will work out. And it's going to be called Tidy Mind Living. And it's about bringing, the, for me, the understanding into the practicalities of life. Mm. Um, and I've got an idea that the way that I would like to share that is not kind of sitting down one-to-one, but more kind of interactive where you're actually doing something so out walking the dog and having the conversation. Or um, one thing that I really love doing is tidying up. And I know that that's not true for other people. 
Um, so I thought, actually, it'd be really nice to have a conversation whilst at the same time as doing something. Mm-hmm. So for someone who might be challenged by or overwhelmed by, you know, the clutter and mess that they've got in their house, that use that as an opportunity to spend time having a meaningful conversation while at the same time as doing something productive. So at the end of the conversation, you, you kind of can look around and see that there's a physical change as, and hopefully there would be some kind of, you know, personal internal change as well. So that's my, that's my intention. Great. To do that. Oh, well, I, obviously I can, having been a guinea pig for you, <laughs> I can recommend that um, because um, um Tidiness is not my number one um, asset, <laughs> so I really enjoy the, the the guinea pig session, and I'm very grateful that that, that um, we did. And um, and I also think that it's nice there what, what, that you illustrated, kind of bringing reflection and wisdom to the process of sharing this and trusting that you know that you. That, you you had done the, the, these talks and and um, and they'd been well received and then you just reached a point where where it it, it felt right to stop for a while mm. um, and and rather than you know give in to the oh no no I must build on this and push through and push through um, you know listening to that and 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 I know that you also made some other changes in your life and 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 I think that's a wonderful illustration that you you know that there is an element of us um, being you know, will, willing to, you know, willing to hear that, willing to allow life to unfold, and then willing to take up those opportunities when when they present themselves as a fresh idea or a new idea or this direction now. And I think that's very different from other kinds of um, other kinds of work. You know, where you really, where you are really bringing in that. Not that it has to be. I mean, you could bring those same principles to other kinds of work, but just trusting that inner voice, trusting that inner direction, um, trusting life, I guess. Something like T2 here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, I think you, you illustrated that really nicely. Yeah, I, th- I think what happened was when I left the, the license trade and I started doing the talks, I wasn't, in a full-time job anymore mm-hmm. um, and, and I've now been in a full-time job for the last almost year and a half so when I wasn't working and I wasn't around other people it was and, I, and there were people coming to the, my, my classes who were in work and you know off work with depression and you know really challenged at work with other people or challenged with people in their lives and their personal lives I kind of felt like I'm not experiencing any of that. So it became, it seemed, I don't know, it seemed disingenuous for me anyway, from my perspective that I was talking to people about things that I had kind of lost touch with. Hmm. But then I went back into the world of work and it was like, ah, now I understand. (laughs) Now I understand what what they were talking about because I had forgotten about all this. Yeah. all of the dynamics of working beside other people um, and so it just became really obvious to me that while I think sometimes talking about the, the principles can seem really out there and so it can be quite challenging to, to kind of get a grasp of what it's about so to kind of fuse the Okay, here's this understanding, but actually here's how it can be really helpful in practical everyday life. Mm. And that's why going from tidy mind to tidy mind living, you know, Mm. makes sense to me. Because it's not just about, here's this wonderful understanding and you'll feel wonderful and, you know, life is a bowl of cherries. Yeah. Uh, But actually, here's here's how this understanding can have a really big impact on your life no matter what your circumstances are mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah there's something very powerful about demonstrating that isn't there you know you're, it's not just a theory you, you know you are facing the difficult colleague or the oppressive boss or whatever yeah, yeah um and the the, the the power that comes from that example um 
I heard it put just this morning, um, you know, just, uh, we will come to see that this thing really works. And, mm. um, you know, it's, it's far more, that the, the power is far more than if you're just talking about it theoretically. And it makes it very easy for the person who's not in, in, in that position to say, well, it's all right for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and definitely. You may, know, you may know within yourself that you, you would show up differently in the world of work. But if you're actually demonstrating it um, day in, day out, week in, week out, there is something about that, um, that you know, the, that experience that's very, um, you know, bears a powerful witness to other people. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, what confirmed it for me was... Um, Mindfulness has kind of been suggested that it might be getting introduced in in our work, and we went to a talk a couple of days ago. And the, the the woman who was doing the presentation says, "You know, what group of people in the world would you say are the are the calmest or something like that?" And one of the girls in my team said, "Oh, David McMullen." <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing on the inside because I thought. That's so not true. Mm. Also, that is light years away from what anyone, how anyone would have ever described me. Mm. You know? Um, so it's, it still feels strange that when people say to me, you know, you're so calm. You've got a really, and you know, various people in work have said, you know, I love talking to you because I always just feel really peaceful. And I'm not doing, I'm not doing anything, you know, I'm not trying to, to, to make that happen. I'm just having a conversation with them. And that's really, really interesting to me because that's not how anybody in my old life, when I worked in, you know, bars and clubs, mm -hmm. would have ever, ever described me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's proof to me that, yeah, yeah, I have. Because the other thing I realised is, it's so easy to overlook any change that's taking place because that then becomes your new normal. Yeah, and it happens very naturally as well. It's not happening through a lot of effort. Mm. <laughs> so it's just, it's just integrated very naturally. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's fascinating and it continues to be um, fascinating and, and new ways of talking about it. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm looking forward to being able to do that because I get so, I, I realised that I get so caught up in the language mm -hmm. that it created a big barrier for me. Mm. I felt I couldn't talk about this until I had, you know, a profound like enlightenment experience because then I would be able to know what to say. Mm -hmm. And then it was on, you know, a couple of weeks ago where I realised I just need to talk about it the way that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that has that that feels really light. Mm, mm. Um, so I was like, oh yeah, I don't need to talk about the three principles mm -hmm. or mind consciousness, whatever. Yeah. Um, because actually, I can't really talk about that in a way that has any impact because I've not had that experience. Yeah. So yeah. I'll talk about what has impacted me, what I know for certain. Um, and hopefully that that will be enough until I see different and being okay with doing that. Great, that's great. That sounds like a good place to, to draw to a close. I'm conscious of our time. Okay. Even if people want to contact you, um, what's the best thing? Um, at the moment, there isn't anything official, mm -hmm. but... Um, in the very near future, there will be the tidymindliving.com okay. website uh, where I will be, um, you know, as a way, it will be a way for me to clarify my own thinking uh -huh. um, and also hopefully offer something that, you know, could be valuable to, to someone. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So tidymindliving.com coming soon. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much for joining me today. I've really enjoyed our conversation, really enjoyed our friendship over the years. And, um, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. And, 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 and you know, and, and, you know, and I, I can't think what to say. Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, and, and your friendship has been, you know, such a blessing, actually. 
So I'm really grateful that you started your, your meetup group because otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation today. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, I, I'm just going to say thank you and goodbye and thank you everyone for, for listening. <laughs> bye bye just now. Bye bye.